night may be long and the dark may be deep, but the answers are there to be found. Whether it's the normal, the abnormal, or the paranormal, you're in the right place. Let's go beyond reality. Welcome to the show, everyone. Great to have you along here as I, <laughs> I had to race to get ready for this program because I had just finished the political talk show that I'm doing, uh, well, from 9 to 10 Eastern, so... Uh, it gives me an hour between the end of that show and the beginning of this show. And although I do a lot of my prep earlier in the day, um, still, the, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done in that hour before the show starts. So we made it. We're on time here, and we're really excited about the discussion we're going to have tonight. Hello to everybody in the chat room. Great to see all of you filing in. And if you are new to the program, welcome to you as well. Please subscribe, regardless of where you're listening to the show. We've got a channel on Twitch. We also have a channel on YouTube. That's where our chat room, or most of our chat room is. We, of course, have chat on uh, Twitch as well. And then we also have a podcast version of the show. I encourage you to subscribe to all of them. And that way, the show is always available to you when you are ready to listen, whether it's live or to the, pre, to the recorded version of the, the episode uh, when that's available. And just speaking of that, as far as uh, uh, archives go, the YouTube channel has, I think we're up to about 600 back episodes of this program on the YouTube channel. It's all available to you free of charge. Just subscribe, share it when you can. We appreciate that. And uh, any support that you want to offer the program, we appreciate that too. There's a couple of ways to do that. The Patreon uh, link is available on most of the videos, but if you can't find the link, it's patreon.com slash Joha, J-O-H-A-W. That's the name of our production company. Or if you are a podcast listener, there is a little link down at the bottom of the podcast description that says support this podcast. You can just click on that. It gives you a way to support it right through the podcast software as well. So either way, again, not, not uh, required, not essential, but certainly appreciated if you can support us that way. So thank you so much for those who do. All right, so tonight tonight we're going to be talking about uh, basically a legend in the discussion of ancient aliens, and that is uh, Philip Coppins. We have uh, Philip's wife on, or widow, I guess I would have to say. Kathleen McGowan will be here to talk about her late husband's work, plus her own work. She's an author, and she's written a trio or a trilogy of books called the Magdalene Tr Line Trilogy, and we'll, uh, we'll see what that's all about as well. Uh, Kathleen is very accomplished. She's been on uh, Ancient Aliens herself. She's also been on the show The Curse of Oak Island, which I'm dying to talk to her about that, given the fact that you all know I watch that show rather religiously. Now, I have to say, these the last two seasons haven't been all that exciting. This particular season, not all that exciting. But I, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt this time around. I'm assuming because they started the season off with the COVID problem. They couldn't travel. They couldn't get to the island. When they got there, they had to quarantine for two weeks. I'm assuming that the season was shortened. When I say the season, I mean the the the, the uh, searching season. The, the weather in Nova Scotia, obviously a little more challenging than it is here in upstate New York, and it's challenging here, uh, particularly because they're on the water. So it gets it gets uh, nasty rather quickly on Oak Island. So their, their season... Uh, where they can actually get out there and do the work is uh, is a little bit limited. So I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. And I agree with many of you who have said, you know, Oak Island's getting a little tiring. It is, but I'm still anxious to see where they end up. Any one hole in the ground, any, you know, turn of a shovel, any... Uh, scoop with the backhoe, any of that stuff could turn up something monumental. So that's what keeps me watching. Plus, I have to tell you that um, I have watched, you know, I, I've known about this story well before the Curse of Oak Island television show existed, and I've always had a fascination with it. So all of that keeps me tuning in every week and hoping that at some point we get some exciting uh, finds. You know, the first few seasons, they did some pretty big stuff. It seems like they scaled back their efforts. Um was it last season or the season before where they were they they put the coffer dam? Or I, I know I'm getting into details here, and if you haven't watched the show, all of this is gobbledygook. But um, they put a coffer dam. They basically pushed the ocean back so they could get into uh, a beach area, a cove, and see what was under the water. And they found some pretty cool stuff under there. But they kind of just I don't know. They find this stuff, and then they just kind of let the you know they pull the coffer dam out. The water comes back, and we don't hear about it again. I don't know. Don't really know what that's about. But either way, Kathleen has been on the program a couple of times, I believe, and we'll, uh, we'll have an opportunity to talk to her about this. And, of course, she has appeared on Ancient Aliens 
as well. And as I mentioned prior to this program, I did my political talk show. If you at all have an interest in politics and political discussion, and I think most of you know where my politics lean, I would encourage you to go to the channel that we have created for this political talk show. It is called the Independence, ending in E-N-C-E, Independence Gang. It's on YouTube at the Independence Gang. Find it. Um, there's, I don't know, seven or eight episodes there now, plus some fun stuff that we've done. All right, let's go to break. Let's get Kathleen on with us, and let's begin this discussion. It is Beyond Reality, and we'll be right back. Hey, it's JV here. You know I've asked for your support in the past, and I'm going to do it again because it's really, really important. And there are a couple of ways you can support the show, and it's so inexpensive. Now, you can go to Patreon, and you can become a Patreon supporter, and we really, really encourage that. But there's also another way. If you look at the description of the podcast, if you're a podcast listener, and you scroll down to the bottom, there's a way to support the show directly through the podcast app. And it's only 99 cents a month. It's less than a buck. You probably have that change in your couch right now. That dollar a month, less than a dollar, goes a long way in helping us produce this program, provide great interviews for you during the course of the week. I thank you in advance because the support is so important to the program. Again, thanks for being here, everyone. We've got a very active chat room right now, and I thank you all for joining us and being part of the conversation through our chat room. If you're looking for the chat room there's a couple places you can find it we do have a chat room on twitch uh the more active chat room at this point is on our youtube channel and again if you just search my name jv johnson you'll find it very easily the name of the program on youtube is jv johnson's beyond paranormal um so we invite you to join subscribe uh, and participate there as well. As I said tonight, we've got a really uh, a special treat for you. Um, Kathleen McGowan is our guest, and uh, she's an author. She has been on Ancient Aliens. She has been on The Curse of Oak Island. She's the author of the Magdalene Line Trilogy series of books, and we're excited to have her on the program. Kathleen, welcome to Beyond Reality. Great to have you here. Oh, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I have to tell you, um, even during the break when we, we, you know, we got you connected, we got you set up, uh, just the way you answered the phone added about, I don't know, uh, 100 watts of energy to the program. <laughs> You've got a <laughs> lot of energy, and I can sense it, and that's terrific. I'm really, oh, really happy to have you here. It keeps me going. Yeah. Um, there's so much to talk about. Obviously, we're going to talk about your work. We're going to talk about your late husband's work as well. Uh, he's sure. he's a, a, obviously a legendary figure in the discussion of ancient aliens, and some of these things we'll be exploring tonight. But how did you get into all this? How did it start for you? Well, you know, I grew up in a, in a relatively paranormal environment, actually. Um, so I was kind of born into it. I was, you know, I was born and raised in L.A., my mother came from a very long line of Irish pagans, um, and I was just raised with a lot of interesting stuff. We lived in a haunted house. Um, I think I got my first deck of tarot cards when I was about five or six, the little miniature Rider weight deck, which my mom gave me so I could sort of play with symbols and that type of thing. And, you know, I had my first astrology books when I was about 10, so... I just kind of grew up in this world of realizing that there was a lot more out there. And um, it just kind of, you know, grew from there. And then, you know, I, I studied journalism um, out, of, out of high school into college. And uh, then I wanted, to be, I wanted to be a journalist, and I was working overseas. And it was sort of during that period of, of wanting to be a journalist and wanting to report truth that I came up against this question about what is truth, Right. And things that were happening weren't being reported the way that they happened. And a lot of sort of aha moments in my sort of early 20s when, you know, all of my kind of idealistic versions of what it was going to be like to go and, and report international news versus what was really being reported just made me go, oh, wow, there's something else happening here. And I think it, the combination of my background and those experiences in journalism just made me say, you know, my mission is to go and search for what truth looks like in a lot of different ways than what we're being told. Well, you probably are aware that the roots of this particular program, and my work specifically, is from the ghost haunted house uh, world, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I, I would be very remiss if I didn't ask you a little more about this haunted house you grew up in. First of all, <laughs> what was the, what type of activity were was you and your were you and your family experiencing, and what were your thoughts as a as a child growing up in that environment at the time? Well, it's funny because um, it's it's somewhat similar to um, what, what ended up the uh, plot of Poltergeist in that the part of the San Fernando Valley where I grew up is all 
Native American burial ground. Um, And it was specifically Chumash and Gabrieleno Indians who were in that territory. And the region where I grew up in Granada Hills, it was re- it's very close to the San Fernando Mission, right? Okay. So that was, mm-hmm. that was all tribal territory. And we would discover later um, that our particular, like, like the block that we lived in was, was, a, um, was a smokehouse. It was a burial center. And they would bring the bodies of their deceased into this, into this area and they would start fires around them, and they would they would bless them with sacred smoke. Oh, wow. So when I was a kid, the house would just sometimes fill up with smoke, and um, mm-hmm. not so much you not so much you could see it, but you the smell was overwhelming, mm-hmm. you know. And um, and when that would happen, there would usually be some kind of poltergeist activity. Things would fall off the walls, you know. The lamps would start swinging. It kind of sometimes it felt like we were having an earthquake, right? Things would just kind of yeah. rattle. Yeah. Uh, and then it would come and go. And it was funny because my mom, my mom was, you know, an incredibly psychic sensitive woman. So it was really she and I that had the most experiences. I had brothers and my brothers were kind of freaked out by all of it, (laughs) but I, I was into it. I thought it was really exciting and interesting. So when we would like dig things up in the garden, I remember when we were digging in the backyard and we came across, um, some artifacts. And they were, they turned out to be tomahawk heads. Oh, wow. um, they were, yeah, they were war pieces. And one of them had blood on it. Um, oh. And it was dried. And um, we brought it into the house. And that night, there was horrific poltergeist activity in the house. Uh, the, the kitchen was crazy. The cupboards flew open. There were dishes flying around. And um, my mom's like, okay, we have to get these out of the house. And um, so she went and she found a, a chumash elder and um, gave them to him and said, do what you would like with these. And, you know, we'll donate anything else that we find, you know, to the Chumash Museum or wherever you want to put them. And um, he came over and left the house and uh, things started to calm down. But periodically, like I'd be sitting there with my mom, we'd be watching TV and we'd both kind of look and she'd say, did you see that? And we both kind of see something walking past us. Um, And so there were, there were a lot of things like that. She once saw a full-blown apparition in her bedroom. Like oh, wow. She was brushing her hair in the mirror, and she looked up, and she saw what she said was an Indian child standing behind her and looking at her in the mirror. And um, I never saw her scared except then. That scared her. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> you know, in, in the list of paranormal uh, occurrences, you know, things that can happen to you from a paranormal standpoint, that's one of the creepiest. If you're looking in a mirror yeah. Yeah. and you see an image behind you that's not supposed to be there. Yeah, and I, so I'm glad I didn't experience that one, but um, but she did, and uh, but again, once she had the 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 too much elder come through, uh, and then she also had a priest come through. She figured she would just kind of make sure that she <laughs> covered all the bases. Uh, you know, we smudged, we did all kinds of things, and then things started to calm down. But there were actually we just you know later on I did some research and discovered that there were several houses in the area that were renowned for poltergeist activity, and they were all within about a mile from where I lived. Oh, wow. Wow. How long did you live? Did you live throughout your childhood till adulthood? Or Yeah, I, I lived there from the time I was about three till I was, yeah, till I was in my early 20s. Did you ever, went off to, did you ever uh, go back or experience it from a, like a professional perspective where you actually did uh, what we would consider today to be a paranormal investigation? I never, I never did anything like that. I mean, probably should have. Um, but I certainly, as I was, as I was older, I looked at it differently. Yeah. I experienced it differently and I've had, you know, a lot of experience now, um, with, you know, the, the other worlds. I'm a, a bit of a veil walker myself. So, um, I would say, I think that it had really kind of calmed down. By the time when I came back, like I, because I lived overseas for a long time, I was in Ireland. When I came, by the time I came back from Ireland, in my early twenties, like it felt like everything was kind of calm. Like I don't know if things had left, but it it just there wasn't there doesn't seem to be that kind of activity anymore. Do you think you you maybe and your mother were part of the fuel that uh, fueled that activity? I do, I do think that because you know I, I kind of the kind here's how I look at it. I always say it's kind of like a, a spiritual slot machine. Like everything has to line up. 
You know, it's the right. place, it's the people, it's the energies. And when all those things line up, that's when there's kind of, there's a breakthrough, right? And um, so I think that it was, it had a lot to do with us being there and being able to feel it. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say that we caused it, but I think our being there in some way hmm, enabled it. Does that make sense? And it absolutely makes sense. I mean, that's not unusual, particularly when you start describing power, uh, poltergeist activity. There tends to be a, a human source of fuel for that activity, and often it's a, it's a feminine human source of fuel for that activity. So that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So I, I think I think so. And, and it was always she and I who who you know saw it and, and heard things first. So it does make sense. So you, you developed this curiosity. Obviously, you had a childhood that was filled with reasons to have this curiosity. Um, how did you start evolving into this being part of your professional life? Well, I think, you know, what happened was I went to, you know, I, was in, I lived in Ireland and I was doing, working over there. Um, and that was when I was involved in this sort of political journalism early in the 80s. And, um, and then I... You know, I was also studying um, Celtic, Celtic mythology, Celtic legends, Celtic magic, all those things that were part of my culture on my mother's side. And I've always known that I wanted to write about that. I wanted, you know, I, I've always had this real desire to bring magic back to the world because I was raised in it. And it's, I meet so many people who have no concept of that. Right. You know, and, it's, and, and, and in the world we're in now, there's so much cynicism, right? And um, and because I was raised with this idea that there's so much more than we can even imagine out there, you know, it's so exciting to me. So I always knew that I wanted to find a way to to, to share that with other people, right? To to bring it to life somehow. And so um, from there, I kind of evolved. My feminism evolved, and I realized that if I'm searching for the truth, the place where you know there has been a lot of untruths told is in the history of women. You know, and women are often neglected in history or maligned and misunderstood. And that I wanted to start, you know, looking at, the, at, at that. So I started down this kind of rabbit hole of uh, women in history who I felt had been given a bad rap and who maybe needed to be looked at differently because, you know, history is written by the victors, right? And, um, and in that, I also discovered that women who had spiritual connections or spiritual authority or power were often the most maligned. They were, they, you know, and that's the witch trials, right? That's yeah. the burning times all over the world, mm -hmm. right? Powerful women were scary. And so I knew that that was, you know, something I wanted to work on. And, and that's where I started to go. And then I, I fell down the rabbit hole with, you know, the Mary Magdalene experience in France. And it's just taken me on this really incredible journey. You have, uh, and I've mentioned it a couple times already, you've got the Magdalene Trilogy. It's uh, obviously mm -hmm. three books. Um, and you spent a great deal of time studying um, Mary Magdalene and her presence, I think, in France, you said. Yeah, um, in France. Talk a little bit about this. Why is that story so inspiring? And, and then give us a little bit of an idea about uh, this trilogy, what it's all about. So the, the thing that really, that really grabbed me, so when I decided I was going to write about women, and... Um, when I, because I was remember I was raised a pagan, so I didn't necessarily have uh, you know any kind of real Christian sympathies at the time. Right. Um, but a friend of mine said, "Hey, you got to you're going to write this book about women who've been maligned and misunderstood. You've got to start with Mary Magdalene." And I said, "Why?" And this is 1993. And she said, "Because the Church actually admits that she is none of those things." that they have said she is for the last 1,500 years. For 1,500 years, they've been calling her, you know, a fallen woman and a, and a, a prostitute and right. all of these things, when in fact she was the apostle of the apostles and the, the person that Jesus essentially left his ministry to and all these other things. Um, so in the 1960s, during Vatican II, the Church came out and said, hey, we, pro <laughs> we probably shouldn't have done this, um, she really isn't any of those things in the, you know, in 599, the Pope at the time thought it would be a really good idea to create this icon of repentance that people could identify with. And so they took this amazing character 
who was Mary Magdalene, who's present in all the important stuff, right? She's at the foot of the cross in the crucifixion. That's right. She's there for the resurrection. And they combined her with these unknown sinners in the Bible, and that way they created this, this kind of poster girl. If someone this fallen and this dirty could be redeemed, then so can you. And so that became the story for the next 1,500 years. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a smear campaign. It's a, let, the whole thing is a lie. Let me just pause you for a second, because I'm really curious about this, and sadly I don't know enough about it. Um, when you say the church came out and said they had actually misrepresented who Mary Magdalene was for all these 1,500 years, was, it, was that an official announcement from the Catholic Church? Was it a particular yes. sect? Does it come from like one of the, I guess we'll call them lost books of the Bible? Where, where does this, all this start? So the, uh, the, the, sort of the, the apology that came out in the 60s was from the Catholic Church, right? So the thing is, is that if you read the Gospels, and just the Gospels, and you read with places where Mary Magdalene is mentioned, she is always mentioned as the most important follower and the person who is there all the time, the only one who doesn't run away when things get ugly, and the one who is there at the time of the resurrection. Now, part of my work, and I have a book coming out in July called The Magdalene Way, where I'm writing about this, is that this whole idea of resurrection Anytime there is a resurrection in the New Testament, Mary Magdalene is there. Yeah. She is the catalyst for the, for the greatest miracles that occur, and she has been completely eradicated. And my argument is because she was so powerful, because she was so magical, and then we, in these later things that were discovered, this Gnostic, the Gnostic material, so there was a gospel of Mary Magdalene That's that right. was discovered in Egypt in the 1800s, late 1800s. And it's fascinating. And then the Nag, the Nag Hammadi um, Gospels, the library of scrolls that was found in Egypt in 1945, contains the Gospel of Philip, which is, half of it is about the authority of Mary Magdalene, the fact that Jesus loved her more than anyone else, the fact that Jesus taught her uh, mysteries that he would never teach to anybody else, the fact that she was the leader of these apostles after his death. So there is so much information about how powerful she was that that we've lost, and it's really important that we reclaim it now. Wow. Um, that's an amazing story unto itself. But uh, you, you've studied this for a long time. You've dug into it. Uh, is the Magdalene Trilogy, now that's a, a series of three novels, right? Yes. So it's fictional, so, but what, what's the inspiration, and is it based on historical accounts at all? It's based on, so I have done tw- now almost, I'm going into my 28th year, 28 years of research, four continents, um, on who Mary Magdalene was in terms of just digging into, you know, ancient documents and a lot of stuff in French that has never really been utilized by modern scholars to, to get a really good idea of who she is. So my, I wrote it as fiction because I wanted these stories to be something that people could feel. I wanted it to be an emotional experience. I didn't want it to be a cerebral, a cerebral nonfiction thing. I wanted people to get involved in the emotion of the story. So the trilogy is called The Magdalene Line because it's also based on the idea that Magdalene did have children with Jesus and that throughout history, some of the most important women and some of the, the great queens have been members of her family, descendants, members of the Magdalene line. And that's been a huge piece of my, um, all of my research. So the first book is about Mary Magdalene, and it tells her story from the point of view of completely reimagining what the first century could have looked like if she were different than we believe. Um, the second book is about one of her descendants, an astonishing woman, uh, an Italian countess from the 11th century, who was the first modern woman, created the first uh, shelters for domestic violence, was the first to declare that the poor were equal to the rich. Just astonishing character. And the third book is about the Renaissance and how um, the Florentine artists, particularly Botticelli and Michelangelo, were influenced by this, this same heresy in um, a lot of their art and how their art is encoded with a lot of this information. Wow. Uh, and they're all already available, right? They've, they've been published? 
Oh, yeah. Those have been out for a long time. Okay, good. Uh, those were all New York Times bestsellers. That's so terrific. Awesome. That's really, that's yeah. fascinating. And and I, I appreciate you kind of bringing me along in this conversation, too, because I really am not the, as familiar with that as I should be. Now, I know there's some pop culture stuff out there that, I mean, I've seen the Da Vinci Code. I've seen some right. of this other stuff that kind of touches on these ideas. What are your thoughts on that stuff? Well, you know, the thing is, with the, the Da Vinci Code um, is kind of a double-edged sword for me in that um, the, the positive side is it brought a lot of people into these ideas, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, that was the most successful piece of fiction of all time. So, you know, it, it was really important in that it made people go, oh, wow, like, we've never heard this idea. So it, did, it opened a lot of doors, you know, it opened people's minds. And, I, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, the position that it took was, uh, was very narrow. You know, it, it was very much that there is a bloodline and it's very special and the people who are part of it are, you know, are this and that. And, and that's, that's really not the point for me. You know, the point for me is that this incredible woman comes to France following the crucifixion, creates her own version of Christianity that is based, that is entirely non-dogmatic, that's based on love and charity and taking care of each other and community. And it grows up completely in counterbalance to what's happening in Rome. And because Rome is becoming about power and authority and hierarchy, and that we have these two very different things happening, you know, in terms of what this movement could become. And of course, ultimately, there were crusades against the people in France who were following these Magdalene traditions, and the church did try to wipe them out in what was essentially the first Western genocide. It's, um, you know, the, the church has a history of um, taking positions like that, whether it's against science yeah. or whether it's against people or, or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it just shows the, the fall, fallibility of, of the human part of of the church you know yeah. um whether you believe in catholicism i'm a catholic i was i was mm-hmm. uh, you know raised that way um i'm not necessarily a practicing catholic but i believe in the ideas i just don't always believe in the people absolutely you know and and i you know i think that where as as an author and as you know a, I, I hope a type of teacher i think the thing that i am most proud of is uh, so many letters, because I published the first book in 2006, so it's been out now for quite some time, 15 years. Um, but I, the letters that I get from people that say, your version brought me back. Your, your version of the story made it okay for me to, to, love, you know, to love my spirituality again. You brought me back to Jesus, because this is a version of him that I can, I can really believe in, because the whole story, the way that I tell it, is about love and not about dogma and not about going to hell and not about those kinds of elements. So that's what, you know, that was a big part of my, my goal was to try to show people, hey, there's a really different version of this story and it's so beautiful that we can't let it get lost. Well, it's amazing stuff, and it's. Uh, I'm glad. I'm. You know, I, I always enjoy talking to people who have done this kind of work because it's so enlightening, and it's actually very, very refreshing as well to hear that perspective. Um, I also look at the clock here, and I realize that it, that we're going to run out of time before we run out of topics. <laughs> so I want. Yeah. I'm going to have to move it along here. Let's talk about first of all. You know, obviously. Um, I'm sorry about the very untimely loss of your husband. Um, Thank you. You know, uh, what an important uh, body of work he had had done prior to losing him. And, you know, we lost him well before his time. And, and it's certainly a big loss to the community of um, people who are interested in these particular topics. Let's talk a little bit about your relationship. When did you meet Philip? Um, I met Philip in 2009, uh, in France, we were both doing research on this topic, actually. Um, I was doing, mine was very Magdalene-based, and, you know, his was, he was looking at other sort of aspects of, you know, France is very fascinating, and he was, we were working in this village called Rennes-le-Chateau. I don't know if you have heard of it, um, but it's this, it's a, this really fascinating village where it has, you know, 2,000 years worth of mysteries, and, and treasure seekers go there, and there's a lot going on there, so... Um, he and I met there, and it was uh, pretty much love at first sight. We just 
you know, I was, I had just come out of a, a divorce and, um, I wasn't looking for, you know, for anything like this, but it was just one of those situations that, you know, it was, you know, after the, the first, you know, the first few hours of talking to each other that we just went, this is just it. You know, you, there's just, there, there are some things that are undeniable and, you know, we were finishing each other's sentences by the second hour and we realized that, you know, we'd been walking the same path. I had used books, his books and books that he had published without knowing it in my research, um, you know, so we just, you know, we were just sort of destined to be together and we were very much yin and yang. I was, I was very much the divine feminine and, you know, he was very much the very, very cerebral, very scientific, um, very committed to the ancient alien theory, but also very, very open minded about pretty much everything. You know, um, he just, he was, he was a grail guy. And by that, I mean, like, he believed the whole concept of, Searching for the Holy Grail was about asking questions, right? It's always about asking questions. This book's called The Ancient Alien Question. The subtitle is that it's an inquiry, you know? So he was always about, you know, I don't want to proselytize. I don't want to preach. I don't want to convert anybody. I just want people to ask questions about what else could possibly be out there. And I just really loved that about him. You know, by now, Kathleen, with all the work you've done and all the traveling you've done, you have to know that those things, as you pointed out, you weren't looking for a relationship like that at the time. Those things only happen when you're not looking for them. It's true. It's absolutely true. Um, so you you kind of said yin and yang. Um, you what, What's your position on what the ideas that that uh, Philip was working on and talking about and writing about what, where do they fall in your hierarchy of beliefs? Well, it's funny because, you know, initially um, I was very much a skeptic about the alien theories. Uh, in fact, because I am a redhead, he called me Scully. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. and he would say that to me all the time. Okay, Scully, just listen. I'm listen to what I have to say. And he was very much a Mulder character, so it was kind of a fun dynamic for us. Um, but the thing was, for me, because I'm such a humanist, you know, my, my feeling was always, if we give credit to aliens and alien contact for building these amazing things, you know, the pyramids, Stonehenge, etc., then aren't we taking away from human accomplishment? Right. So that's always been my spot of resistance with the ancient aliens thing. I'm like, I want, I want humans to have credit for what humans did. And Philip was the one who really told me and taught me and showed me that those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can celebrate that humans are amazing and that we're, we're capable of incredible things and certainly have been in the past, um, even more than, more so than now. And also believe that they may have been in communication with higher intelligences. And that's kind of where we found our, our middle ground. You know, the, like we would have these conversations about, you know, what is an extraterrestrial? Because his point was, well, you believe in angels and angels are extraterrestrials. They're beings that are not of the earth. So, you know, what is the difference between an angel and, you know, a star person? You know, there's, they're potentially the same thing. So I think, you know, what, Philip really got me to open my mind um, even wider. And I always thought that I'd had a really open mind, but I realized that I was still pretty skeptical on some of this stuff. And and just, you know, living with him and and participating in Ancient Aliens with him and and watching him record hours and hours and hours of television and just the information that he had in his brain, it it was just an incredible thing to watch. And, you know, it was... I, I, he was <laughs> he was an irresistible force um, when he would speak about this subject, and even the, the most hardened skeptics that I knew would listen to him and go, "You know what? He makes some really good points." You know, <laughs> I'm at least going to go back and look at it, and that's what he wanted to do with this book, this ancient aliens question book that he wrote ten years ago. It's now the tenth anniversary of it, which is why we're re-releasing it with some fanfare, because I think now more than ever. I think the new, a new generation of younger people are going to find this information really interesting, and we want them to ask the same question. You know, what if there's something else out there? You know, what are we missing? You know, what, how much richer can our human experience be 
if we understand that there's a lot more going on than just what we can see here. All right. So I have to ask this question um, because it may kind of set a foundation for a lot of the other things we're talking about here tonight. And that is with the work that you've done. And when it comes to discussing even a lot of components of Christianity or even other religions for that matter, but in our context, it's generally been Christianity. There's often these references of either interstellar travelers or, uh, you know, um, sky people or, Mm -hmm. you know, these these hints at what might be some type of extraterrestrial visitation that's recorded in biblical history. In your research, specifically when you were researching and and learning about Mary Magdalene, did you ever come across any of that stuff? Well, most of that stuff shows up in the Old Testament, right? That's right. So we, we, when we hear about the Watchers and, you know, the marrying into the daughters of men and that type of thing. Right. Um, and... Yeah, and, you know, I mean, this is what Eric Von Daniken does so brilliantly, right? This is a lot of the work that he's done starts with, with those biblical understandings. That's actually, he talks about that in the introduction to the book, and does it brilliantly. Now, what I was looking at more with the Magdalene stuff in the New Testament had a lot more to do with um, these more like goddess traditions, right? Like, she was coming from potentially a background of very powerful spiritual women. Even in Jesus' side, you know, the the understanding of of who the Virgin Mary was or who Mother Mary was, you know, now is so different than how she's actually written. I mean, when we first see Mary, she is writing hymns to the Lord, okay? A barefoot shepherdess, ignorant girl who, you know, is surprised by an angel appearing to her, is not educated and wealthy enough to be writing hymns to the Lord. We're talking about very strong women from the very beginning. You know, her mother, who becomes St. Anne, is there's the legends around St. Anne as a prophetess, as a leader of her community. There's so much information about how strong these women were and, and the authority that these women held in their time. So that's what I was looking for. And I was looking for how how that connected. And if you go back to the to some of the, the earlier Hebrew text, it talks about God as basically a couple. It talks about El and his consort Asherah, and that is basically mother, father, God. And that is what my second book is about, actually. My second book is called The Book of Love, and it's about this idea that God is both male and female, and that that was not a revolutionary concept. That was actually a concept that first shows up in certain parts of the Old Testament. I mean, it's it's all so so very fascinating. The book that you're re-releasing, it's called The Ancient Alien Question, and Philip wrote the book. You said it was 10 years ago. This is the 10th anniversary. Yes. Um, yeah. What was the reaction when it was released? I mean, some of these ideas now, we are almost always, t- at this point, taking for granted. But, right. you know, at the beginning of the Ancient Aliens uh, television show, and that's been a, on quite a run, um, mm-hmm. and, you know, and even even going back as far as, I think it was the early 70s when um, Eric Von Daniken uh, released Cherry to the Gods in the film it's, version of that movie was one of my inspirations for doing what I do. Um, but those ideas were very controversial for a very long sure. time. They're a little more accepted right now and that's because we've been exposed to them more and we've had conversations like this more often right, right. but in 10 years ago when the book was released what was the reaction um you know I, he, of course it was of course it was controversial um but it wasn't as i think because he was on television uh he didn't have he didn't have quite as much as much pushback it, yeah. was, it was very successful uh it did very well people were really curious about it and again because of the way Philip presents material, which is, hey, why don't we ask these questions? Why don't we look at the, the, this? This is really fascinating information. Let's take a look at it. He kind of invites you in without, you know, throwing anything at you. Just like, just come with me and let me show you this. And it's really cool. And I think the, the way that it's presented is so accessible that he did, it, it did just really, really well. And, you know, my son, my youngest son is 19 now, and he was nine when the book came out, and so it was certainly, you know, kind of over his head then, although he was being, you know, 
he, Philip was in his life, so he had exposure to it. But now at 19, he can read this book and go, oh, my God, this is amazing, right? Yeah. And I'm seeing that more kids at his age, young college-age kids, they're really, they're really fascinated by this, and their minds are really open, and, and they want to see this stuff. One of the things that I find really, uh, I guess reassuring would be the word, um, and I'm not even sure where I read this now, uh, but I'm gonna. But I'll, it's a quote that says um, Philip was considered a skeptic by the believers and a believer, yes, by, the believer skeptics. by the skeptics. I love <laughs> that description. It really just makes me so much more comfortable with anything Philip may have said. I mean, uh, it's it's reassuring in a lot of ways. I, I I love that too, and he loved it. He was very proud of it. It was he had originally had it on his website, and I can't. Rem- I honestly don't remember who said it first, but. Uh, it was someone had said it about him, and he said, oh, I love this. The believers think I'm a skeptic, and the skeptics think I'm a believer. And um, and I think I put him in a really good place, because I think it showed you how balanced he was. Balanced and wanted data and information to support his ideas. I mean, that was Always. what the quest was about. Abs- a million percent, Absolutely. And, um, you know, if you look at the, just look at the bibliography in the back of this book, it's pages and pages and pages long. I think it probably took as long to write the bibliography as it did uh, to write the book because he wanted to document all of his research. And, you know, and he was, yeah, he was dogged about it. Um as he worked through all this, I guess let's, let's go back to, uh, to the Ancient Aliens television show. Um mm-hmm. I, I've obviously seen it. I've watched it quite a bit, but I'm not, I didn't watch it from the beginning. So was he involved from the beginning? Yes. Um, he was in it from the very first episode. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually a really sweet story. Philip met Giorgio Suclos in Bern, Switzerland. Um, in 19, uh, Philip was 24 and he was giving a keynote speech at a conference that Eric von Daniken was putting on. On uh, They called it Ancient Astronaut Theory. And Georgia was there. And I think Philip was 24. Georgia was, like, I think, 16. Wow. <laughs> and, um, and that's where they met. <laughs> that's where they became friends. And um, so when uh, Prometheus Entertainment, who is a production company that created Ancient Aliens, knew they wanted to do something with Eric and Giorgio had very much been Eric's protege. You know, they called Giorgio and they said, do you want to do this? And he said, absolutely. And it was about the same time that Philip decided to move to Los Angeles to be with me. So uh, it was at the end of 2009. And Giorgio called him and said, do you want to do this with me? And Philip said, hey, funny thing, I'm in L.A. now. So um, that was kind of the beginning of it. It was Giorgio and Philip and, uh, you know, Eric. And, and uh, that's how it got started. How did you get involved? Well, by about the third, I came in the third season because they started doing some, um, they would periodically do some episodes that were kind of crossovers into my territory. And Philip would get them because he also worked on the writing and the research. And he would get these topics and he'd say, you need Kathleen on this one. This is her topic, not mine. You know, it would be something about, you know, Celtic mythology or, you know, something about an, an ancient goddess or some kind of ancient belief system or mythology that I had studied. And so they started to bring me in as their kind of folklorist mythologist on certain, you know, when it was appropriate on certain subjects, uh, the Knights Templar, the Cathars, you know, the, those kinds of stories, which I was, you know, expert on, they would bring me in for that. That's actually how I ended up on the Curse of Oak Island was because of that as well. So um, I was on from Season three to season 11. So um, I had a very long run in ancient aliens. Wow. And by the way, we will be talking about the Curse of Oak Island, too, because um, I have a lot of questions <laughs> when it comes to that show and those ideas and your involvement there. Um, but uh, one of the things that any of us in this particular line of work where we talk about such issues that I don't consider them controversial. I consider them thought-provoking, but some people consider them controversial. You've got to have some pretty thick skin because people get take they take some of this personally, especially oh, yeah. especially if there's a kind of a crossover with in some way um, disputing religious beliefs or something. You know, yeah. then people get very personal about this. How did Philip deal with that? Because that had to be some a part of his life. Um, he dealt with it brilliantly. I didn't deal with it so well. Uh, <laughs> He because you know he was an Aquarian and he's very 
he was just very level and he just, he was kind of unflappable, you know, he would just go, ugh, people, you know, he didn't really, the, the only time he would get upset is like when some of these like sort of so-called professional skeptics would go after the show really hard yeah. and, and were just kind of cruel and ad hominem attacks and that kind of thing. And, you know, he just, that made him, that made him angry, you know, and he was, he was angry about, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of people who edit Wikipedia that are skeptics and, and there were times when things like that would happen and he would just be like, Oh God, you know, you know, why, why are skeptics, you know, running the world right now? Um, you know, an example of this is that he was, um, he was, he was the first international journalist to write about the Bosnian pyramid discovery in 2005. Oh, wow. And as a result, he became very close to Dr. Sam Osmanigic, who is the, the man who discovered them. And um, over the, the years, he was deeply involved in Bosnia, and I am now too. I've kind of carried on that work for him. And the work that Sam is doing, I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say he's, a, he's the Tesla of our time. He is just genius and fascinating. And he's been so brutally attacked by skeptics. And that's the kind of stuff that was really hard for Philip. Like he, that, that was really upsetting for him. But in terms of himself and taking things personally, he just didn't, you know, he absolutely didn't. Now I had death threats because of the religious stuff. So my, my stuff sometimes got a little bit hairy because yeah, people don't like when you, when you mess with their religious icons, even though Everything that I do in terms of talking about the history of Christianity is super respectful. And I don't challenge anything that's in Scripture. I just, I utilize Scripture to prove my points because there's so much information that actually points to the case that I'm trying to make. But some people, they don't, they're just, they won't, they just won't have it. You know, I was, I was on a radio show two weeks ago and, uh, talking about Magdalene and I got some pretty scary emails afterwards and, you know, and that's, unfortunately, that's going to happen. Why can't we just uh, disagree and, but be respectful? I don't understand that. And it's not just in this work. It's politically, it's all, it's almost everything we do now. It has to be contentious. We can't just agree and, you know, shake hands and move on. Although you can't shake hands anymore. <laughs> Bump elbows, yeah. wave masks. Yeah. If you had and to, move on. Yeah. If you had to encapsulate the ideas that Philip you know, were the nucleus of all of his work. How do you encapsulate? I mean, we talk about these things because we know them, but if someone was right. to tune into this show or stumble upon ancient aliens uh, on the television, but not really know anything about it, how would you explain to them what these ideas are about? Well, it, I think that the most important thing that Philip would want people to know is that he had a strong belief that these extraordinary feats of engineering that occurred in ancient times um, were done with interaction of higher level intelligences, right? And he, but also the one thing that was really important to him, uh, and this is where Philip differs from a lot of other people in the sort of alien world, is Philip also believed that all this contact was benevolent, right? He he discarded out of hand the idea that you know that. The alien contact was ever negative. That you know, uh, humans were a slave race. All of all of those theories about negative contact, um, he he just he wouldn't go there. He those were just something he would discard. He wanted to stay focused on this idea that our ancient ancestors were in contact on a regular basis with higher intelligences and whatever you want to call them, whether it's the gods or angels or star people. There was, there was contact happening and he makes an amazing case for it. Like, I mean, my, you know, I spent a lot of time in Egypt and I'm doing a lot of research in Egypt right now. So it's probably not a surprise that my favorite chapters in the ancient alien question are the ones about Egypt. When he writes about the pyramids as communication devices, um, the pyramids as initiatory uh, in, in, in ways that the pharaohs would be initiated so that they could communicate with the gods. Um, so, you know, that was really what he was, he was most fascinated by was why, why, and where, where did we lose it? Where did, where did all this stuff go? All of these amazing structures that were created and so much evidence that they had to do with connecting with a higher authority or a higher source or a higher intelligence. And then all of a sudden 
you know, all of that just kind of is erased. And so that's what he was really, really exploring. And how do we get it back? And, and can we get it back? And, you know, those were the questions that he really wanted to ask. But again, everything with him was, was about benevolence, about being helped by these higher intelligences. I'm going to ask you about that in a second, but did uh, did Philip have any opinion of or do any work with any contemporary UFO sightings or any of those uh, you know phenomena or ideas? Yeah, he absolutely did. And I mean, he was he was always up to date and and in touch with um you know, with everything that was going on. The only thing he stayed away from publicly he really stayed away from abduction cases because, again, he he didn't want to he didn't want to dabble in anything that could um, be perceived as as negative contact. Yeah. Which is not to say that he didn't believe in it, but just that that's not what he want where he wanted his focus to be. But yes, he was always looking at um, you know the the latest the latest information. Um, he was a huge fan of Edgar Mitchell and what Edgar Mitchell was doing. Um, you know, up in, in his research center and, and, you know, he loved Carl Sagan and he was always looking for, you know, for sort of different things. And one of the things that was sort of interesting is when I, the day that I was asked to write uh, the introduction to this new version, which was, it was last year, it was April 27th, 2020. And as I was writing it, um, <laughs> there was an announcement uh, that the Pentagon had officially released videos of UFO activity. Oh, wow, yeah. And had acknowledged that it was authentic. And it was that was uh, Luis Elizondo, the former Pentagon official, who led the government research program on UFOs. And he said that it was his personal belief that there is very compelling evidence that we may not be alone. And, um, and so there was the part of me that was saying, oh, I wish Philip was here to, to, to hear this. He would love it. And then there's the other part of me that said, he knows. He already knows. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and just recently, we've had a flurry of such disclosure as well. It seems that this, yeah. the pace of this stuff is picking up, which is exciting in a way. Um, I want to ask you about the benevolence idea. You said that Philip uh, firmly believed that the interaction uh, between these ancient aliens and uh, humans was purely uh, benevolent. There are people that suggest, as you pointed out, that you know there was an enslavement going on, that the, that humans may have been slaves to these these uh, higher uh, intelligence beings. Is there any real evidence that supports one way or the other? I'm assuming the only evidence that would support the enslavement idea is that when you look at, at societies and you have one that's very, very much advanced and you have one that's very mm. primitive, you might assume one would dominate the other. Other than that, is there any evidence to, to support either side? Well, I think that the, the other argument you could make with that is that one of them just isn't, wasn't paying attention to this, these other worldly intelligences, and one of them was, right? So is one, is one of those civilizations super advanced because they are connected, whereas the other, the other is not because they are not connected? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that there's evidence of, for me, um, I don't, I don't believe that I've ever seen anything that would convince me there is evidence of being, you know, of negativity, being a slave race, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, it just doesn't really, it doesn't work for me. I just, you know, and I'm a little bit Pollyanna and, you know, I do try to see the light and the love and everything. Um, but he definitely would, if he were here right now, he would say, no, there is, there is no evidence of that, but there is a lot of evidence, um, in the idea that they were here to help us and that they're even, you know, his ultimate belief, his ultimate belief was that they're still out there and they're still willing to help us. We've just forgotten how to do that. We've forgotten how to communicate with with these otherworldly intelligences, and um, and maybe the 21st century is when all of this starts to come back. We'll see. You, we have already mentioned the name uh, Eric von Daniken, and anybody who's in, uh, who understands or has been involved or even heard of this discussion, these ideas that we're talking about, probably knows his name and his work, Charity of the Gods. What was the relationship between uh, Philip and Eric? Oh, Philip just adored and worshipped him, right? I mean, who doesn't? Eric's amazing, and and again, you know, Eric Eric was the one who brought him to Switzerland in uh, 1995, and and invited him to come and and be a, a keynote speaker, and uh, that was, you know, from from there on, he just, you know, he was always he was always under Eric's wing, and and he very much, you know, revered Eric as as the ultimate the ultimate mentor, and and you know. 
and really respected the fact that he, you know, he's, he was uh, he was the OG, right? He was the the first the first guy to really do this. I mean, I also grew up with you know chariots of the gods on our on our um, living room table, mm-hmm. you know, it was on mm-hmm. our coffee table. So you know what Eric what Eric accomplished and and continues to accomplish in his life is extraordinary. I don't even know how many tens of millions of books you know he has that are distributed around the world with his name on them. But um, but yeah, you know Philip uh, adored Eric, worshipped him, uh, revered him, and. Uh, they were they were quite close. I have, you know, I wasn't overstating it when I said that *Chariot of the Gods*, the film. Uh, I wasn't much of a reader as a kid, but the film um, inspired me to have the curiosities that led me to do what I do today. That and the television show *In Search of* with Leonard Nimoy as the narrator; those two things were probably more instrumental in guiding my path to this direction than anything else that happened to me. Uh, so I fully appreciate his work, and he really did spawn a generation of people who wanted to investigate this, explore these ideas, and answer some of these questions. Absolutely. And I loved In Search Of, too. That was a very important part of my development. Great show. It was so good. <laughs> and I can still hear Leonard Nimoy's voice as the narrator. It was just so perfect. Um, you have been exposed to, obviously, all of Philip's work. And you kind of uh, started as you know an outsider looking in and, and almost saying, go ahead, uh, convince me. Um, mm-hmm. Of all the evidence that you have seen or have heard discussed, what impresses you the most? Uh, okay, so I think I would say there's two things, and they're they're kind of different. So when you put them together, I think they make a whole. The first is Roswell. Um, I was not a Roswell believer, and um, Philip wanted to make a documentary about uh, the Marcel family, the family of Jesse Marcel, and mm-hmm. Jesse Marcel was the the first responder essentially um, at Roswell right after the crash, and um, his grandson was um had been speaking with Philip and his grandson was working on a book about how what it was like to be a third generation Marcel in a world where Roswell had completely dictated their lives and um so Philip had uh he had a production deal he was going up to do uh, a documentary about the Marcel family and he really wanted me to come and I really didn't want to go <laughs> and uh you know this was this was when I was still in my full scully stage and he said, listen, these people are really fascinating. And just from a humanitarian point of view, you need to hear their story. So I flew up with him, and I just fell in love with the Marcells and their story. And this, I, what it, what it, the story of what a family has gone through for three generations when their grandfather is the one who saw everything before it was all cleaned up and covered up. And the stories that they had to tell were so extraordinary and so real that it just, it was, they were, it was undeniable for me. I, I just, it was, it it was extraordinary. And, um, he ended up making that the documentary is released. I believe it's called Alien Crash at Roswell. Um, and it, it has the interviews with, uh, Jesse Marcel the third and, um, the information that, that is some of the information that happened in terms of what his grandfather told him he had seen. And, and it was just, it, it just really got me. Again, it was, it's that human element, listening to how his family has been so deeply impacted by that. So that was the first one. And the okay. second one really is, the, is, the, is Egypt. Um, it's just, there's the information that he, that he specifically emphasizes in his book about Egypt, which is something that you don't see anywhere else, is he talks about the pyramid, the pyramid text, in the Pyramid of Saqqara, which happens to be my favorite, my very favorite place in, in Lower Egypt. Um, it's magical. It's powerful. But he talks about the pyramid te- texts and how they're inscribed, and he talks about what they mean. And this is something he goes into in depth in the Ancient Alien Question. And um, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a read and an interpretation that I, you know, I've, I'd never heard before, seen before, about the power of that space um, as an initiatory and communication device that the Pharaoh could communicate um, directly with the gods. And for me, um, you know, it's one of the things that keeps me going back to Egypt over and over again. I was going to ask you again next week. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I know you've, you've spent a lot of time there and continue to do that. Is that in, in more of a, uh, uh, a search for answers in the work that Philip was doing, or is it more related to the stuff that you've been doing or have the two become one? Is that two have 
kind of merge together a little bit. Um, it's a little bit of both. And, um, you know, one of the things that I have been working on is uh, the Egyptian influences in Christianity. And, um, you know, there's, there's extraordinary, extraordinary Christian elements in, in Egypt. And, of course, that's where, you know, the Nag Hammadi scrolls are found, all the, the, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. There's a reason that all of this earth-shattering documentation comes out of Egypt. So that was part one. But part two is I'm working on a, a book right now um, about these women who were the most powerful people in Egypt. Not the most powerful women, the most powerful people. They were called the God's Wives, and they would, were ceremonially married to the god Amun. And even the pharaoh had, had to address these women if they wanted certain things, because only the God's wives could speak directly to the God. So they were like an oracle, but at a really elevated level that even Pharaoh had to answer to. There's so much information about how many powerful women were in Egypt that, that exists in the Egypt, Egyptian culture and in the ancient texts, but no one ever talks about it. It's never really come forward in terms of how important women were. And again, it's this whole idea of of interstellar communication um, that we're talking about. So that's where what Philip was doing and what I am doing kind of come together. So recently, and I don't know how recently, but it was recently, uh, some new, what they're calling new Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in Israel, I believe. When Very you, recently. Yeah, when you hear announcements like that, you must, first of all, your appetite must get very wet. And, <laughs> and I, just, just maybe speculate a little bit for us what, what we might discover from an, a, a, a finding like that. Well, you know, it, it depends. I mean, you know, it, this one's, in, I, I understand, is in, in, in some pieces. So first of all, it's going to take some time to put it all back together. Right. Um, but, you know, it's going to depend. It's gonna, it, could shed, it could shed so much light on, you know, the Essenes who lived in this region. It could shed light on their practices, on their beliefs. You know, some of the things that came out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, particularly the one that's known as the Copper Scroll, are so fascinating and have really, you know, given us a lot to think about and what was happening in, in those early centuries. So, I mean, it's always exciting. I mean, for me, I'm always excited when they find something, you know, that they say, oh, this might, you know, this might be a Gnostic gospel. Um, you know, this might be some kind of find. Like, you know, there was uh, that little fragment that was found about 10 years ago that they were, were calling the gospel of Jesus's wife. That was certainly a very exciting find. So I think that we're, I think that we're still on, on the edge of all kinds of new discoveries. More stuff is being found every day. And now that they, they have ground, like ground sonar and all these things, they're finding all these underground tombs, they're finding all kinds of stuff. Um, so who knows what's coming out, but it, I think it's, we're, I think we're on the verge of a very exciting time. It's amazing to me that that stuff has, is still hidden, that we're still, you know, digging in the deserts or in the sands or whatever, and uncovering these monumental mm -hmm. discoveries. It's, yep. it's, I don't know. It's just, it, it kind of sends shivers down my spine. And what do you think when you hear a report? I mean, I, I, I I'm going to pull things out. I don't know how recent they were, but you know, I remember hearing about the discovery of what they thought maybe it may have been Caiaphas's tomb or um, right. you know, these, these figures that are larger than life in the Bible. And we're discovering uh, evidence of their actual existence, and right. uh, maybe even more. Maybe we're finding even more. When you when you hear of those things, what does it do? Oh, see, I mean that's 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 my jam. I mean nothing <laughs> nothing yeah. that is that is like that is euphoria for me. Like nothing makes me more excited than these kinds of discoveries. And um, like when the Gospel of Judas was discovered, oh my gosh, I was so excited because it brought to light. So some of these theories that I had, in the, not just me, but a number of other people had been, you know, had been proposing for the last 20 years that, you know, things were not necessarily the way that they've been presented. So um, it's just, it's super exciting. And it's also really exciting because we're discovering it now. And that means that there's really not there's not the opportunity to mess with things and cover things up like there used to be, right? Because we're all media all the time. Yeah. You know, there's always somebody with a camera. There's always someone with the information. Whereas in the past, 
if something was discovered that could be controversial, you could probably cover it up. I mean, who knows how many things, you know, have been shut down. I know in Egypt, certainly during the reign of Saudi Hawass, any number of things that were discovered in Egypt over the last, you know, 25 years or so, uh, there I think are a lot of things that we will never know about because he didn't want us to know about them, mm-hmm. you know. So I think there has been a lot of that in the past, but that's an old paradigm, you know. I think the new paradigm that we are moving into is real, you know, uh, a real open, a real open version of discovery. I just don't think things can be covered up anymore. That's exciting. It's exciting to hear that. Um, because we only have a few minutes left, I have to switch the topic to Oak Island. You've made a couple of appearances <laughs> yeah. on that program. It's it's one that I've enjoyed. I don't know what eight seasons now, nine. I'm not even sure. Yeah. Um. I think I think the the amount of discovery has slowed down a little bit, but I guess that's to be yeah. expected. But tell me about your experiences in being involved in that search and what you think of it overall. I mean, is there actually treasure buried there somewhere? I do believe there is. Um. A million percent believe that there is. Do I believe that they will find it? That's another question. Uh, (laughs) um, I'll tell you, so I got involved in Oak Island in the second season, um, early in the second season, because they had discovered the coconut husks. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that, right? I do, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. And And they were doing carbon dating on the coconut husks. And the producers called me in because they knew that I was an expert on the era in which the carbon dating came through. And they said, what would you say, you know, if we told you that the coconut husks had medieval dating? And I said, well, if they're dated between 1200 and 1300, I'll be really excited. And they said, well, they are. (laughs) So I said, okay, now we're talking about, you know, the potential for real Templar activity. So they wanted my input on what that could mean. And ultimately what ended up happening is I took um, Marty and Alex Lagina to France and uh, that's in season two. If you go back and watch the, some of the, the episodes in season two, I take them through France and I show them all the places where their treasure could have come from. I tell them the legends of the treasures of the Templars and the Cathars, the legends of where they could have gone. I introduce them to people who in France who uh, had a lot of information on that. And so we kind of go through that. And then from there, we crossed over to Scotland and we followed this potential path of Templar treasure. And then I, I took them to meet, uh, you know, people in Scotland who are experts. We went to Roslyn Chapel. Uh, and then we talked about how treasure could have gone then from Scotland to Nova Scotia. Of course, Nova Scotia means New Scotland. So there are a lot of reasons why that makes sense. So that was my, my job was to introduce them to these ideas. Basically. Wow, tough job, Kathleen. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing is, is when I saw the episodes when they were they were in France, um, I don't know if I I don't remember specifically the places that they were they were showing and highlighting, but I've been to a lot of those places and similar places, and I've been in in these uh, uh, castle dungeons, if you will, where the prisoners who were there for thirty years, you know, etched things into the walls. Yes. I mean, some incredible yeah. works of art. Actually, it's pretty amazing some of the things they've done but so it all hit home to me and it's very fascinating um you say a million percent you believe there's something there do you think when you say that do you mean that there at one point was and it might still be there or are you convinced that it's actually still under the ground there somewhere there was a time when i was convinced it was still under the ground um i don't know that i am anymore but i am convinced that there has there was something there and it was of critical importance it may or may not be there now I do, I want to believe that there's something there. I really do. Um, I have uh, issues with the way they have gone about some of uh, the work that they've done on the island. Okay, and, I, can't, um, I can't let you just gloss over that. Um, <laughs> I mean, without without being critical, obviously, um, what do what, you think they're just not looking in the right place or not looking the right way? I, I, a little bit of both. I think... Um, one member of the team is like is really willfully difficult and doesn't really isn't really open to a lot of suggestions. Certainly, if they come from women, he is not open to oh, suggestions. Mm, okay. um, <laughs> uh, and I also, you know, there's been here's the thing. One of the things that we talked about when I was taking him through 
these treasures is that the treasures that we are talking about are sacred, of a sacred nature, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's not what they want. They don't want sacred they treasures. They want gold. They have. They want gold. They right. want. The, they want big pirate chests <laughs> of gold and spendable stuff. Right. They want the stuff of the Hardy Boys' dreams. That's what they want. And they told me flat out, we don't want your version of the treasure. And my point is, well, then you won't find my version of the treasure, right? Yeah. Because if what we're talking about, it's like it's very Indiana Jones. I know that sounds cliche, but it, you have to have the right intentions. If you're going after something which could even be the Ark of the Covenant, right, <laughs> then you would have to approach it from a certain point of view. And they don't want to do that. And what Ellen Butler and I did when we were working on the show with them is we gave them a map and we showed them where we thought it was and, and, and where, where, to, where to look and blah, blah, blah. And um, they basically said, yeah, we don't want to do that um, because <laughs> we don't want that. That's not what we're looking for. And if that's there, we don't want to find it. So, you know, they're, they're looking for what they're looking for. They're very sort of focused on finding their pirate treasure, whatever it is. Um, and so... You know, Godspeed. I I wish them well. I will tell you, uh, I I have great love for Marty and Alex. We had a great time when we were in France, and um, I think that both of them are quite open-minded in many ways, and I wish them beautiful lives. Okay. There's a (laughs) coded message there that I think I got, but either way, that's fine. I need to ask you, though. Okay, so um, what has become more valuable to them, the the television show or what might be yeah. buried in the ground oh you mean financially or both. otherwise both i mean part of it's oh. ego driven and, and part of it's money i mean at this point they've spent so much money looking for a treasure i you know i mean the economics have to start get a little getting a little bit weird so is the is the show more valuable at this point than what might be buried underground well again it depends on what's buried underground yeah. i will say that my understanding and i you know I am not intimately involved in the production company finances um, or the Laginas finances. I do know that everybody has spent a lot of money. Yeah. Um, so there have been in- enormous expenditures looking for this treasure. So, you know, at this stage, it would have to be something pretty spectacular right. um, to, to, make it, to make it worth it. But, you know, I think for Rick specifically – He's very much about the, he's really about the, the, the quest. Yeah. You know, Rick is, Rick is all about, you know, we're, we're going in today and we're going to go do this and we're going to get dirty and we're going to, you know, that kind of thing. And so for him, it's really about the experience. And for, for Marty, it's about giving his brother the experience that he wants. And that's one of the things that I have to say that I found really beautiful about working with Laginas is their family dynamic is a really lovely thing to, to watch. It really is. And, you know, Marty's commitment to making sure that, you know, Rick gets to do what Rick wants um, is, really, is really lovely. And it's lovely to a fault because it, <laughs> he will, you know, just continue to make sure that Rick does what Rick wants to do. And what Rick wants to do isn't necessarily always, I, in my opinion, the thing that's going to help them find treasure. But, um, again, my treasure and their treasure – are not the same person. Yeah, yeah. I have to say that um, you know, that, again, there's a soft spot in my heart for what they're doing. The article that they often referred to, especially in the beginning of the series, uh, that I think was in Reader's Digest, which piqued their mm-hmm. interest on this story and this treasure. That same article was, I think, I think the word is mimeographed uh, before there were really <laughs> copy machines um, uh-huh. in, in, back in the dark ages when I was in elementary school. But it was mimeographed by one of my science teachers, um, you know, many years after it appeared in Reader's Digest and given out to the class and said, can anybody figure out how to solve this mystery? And I took it very, very seriously as a kid. I was probably seven, eight, nine years old. I don't even know what it was. And um, it, it began a fascination with that story for me, too. So I, I have a lot, wow. of, a lot of interest in what they're doing because the, the, it was the same article. It was exactly the same one. So That's amazing. Cool. Yeah. Um, we're out of time, Kathleen. This has been a great discussion. Where can people get your books, the, uh, the Magdalene Trilogy and also a Magdalene Line Trilogy, and also uh, the re-release, the 10th anniversary edition of Philip's book, Ancient Alien Question? Um, all the books are available at, you know, pretty much every place where books are sold, whether it's 
uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or independent bookstores online, independent bookstores in your neighborhood. Um, they can order them if they don't stock them. Uh, support independent bookstores. It's always a good thing to do. Um, so yeah, av- available there. Uh, if they want more information on anything, they can go to my website, which is KathleenMcGowan.com, M-C-G-O-W-A-N, and uh, they can uh, sign up for newsletters, and I'll keep them posted on everything that's coming out, including my new book, The Magdalene Way, which will be out in July. Terrific. Again, fantastic discussion. Thank you for sharing uh, some very intimate details about your life and your own personal work and your life with Philip. And uh, it's been a fascinating even- evening, and thank you for your time. Oh, such a pleasure, J.V. Thanks so much. Beyond Reality Paranormal is hosted by J.V. Johnson and produced by Orion Palmer and Slick Eddie Edwards. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please consider supporting the program either through your podcast platform, click on the link in the description, or on Patreon at Joha Productions. If you'd like to be a guest on Beyond Reality Paranormal or you have a recommendation for a guest, contact our producer, Slick Eddie Edwards. Eddie is spelled with a Y at slickeddieedwards at gmail.com.